Hello, and welcome to the Bayside Sermon Series Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Duckworth, Media and Technical Director here at Bayside. This week, we are discussing with Pastor Ken Carlson our second part of our Revision Series. This week, we're talking about advancing the gospel, and we will be in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. This week we're talking about Acts chapter 1 and the ways God wants us to advance the gospel. One of the things that makes Bayside special in our region is the community outreach and ministries that we offer. Treehouse, Wonderfully Made, VBS, Fall Fest, small groups for men, women, singles, couples. God is doing some amazing things here. Pastor Ken, do you have any specific one that excites you the most? Oh man, that's a good question. I um I look back at the the past year and um but one of the you know it's seeing um seeing God work uh in developing uh people's um discipleship uh, has has been such an exciting thing to be a part of um and where we're going next um is is I mean that really excites me. Uh you know, making a greater kingdom impact um than um, you know, if that, if whatever the Lord wants, uh, but in years past, uh, God has been so faithful in, um, expanding the, the ministry of Bayside, um, not to expand the ministry of Bayside, but to expand his kingdom. Um, so I think God has been honoring our commitment to him and our commitment to the great commission, um, and our commitment to, uh, making, uh, transformed disciples here at Bayside. Uh, so, how we're going to do that moving forward is uh, is something that that really really uh, excites me and being more intentional with equipping our own people um to not only understand the gospel the full gospel the whole gospel um uh you know not that not only that Christ died for them but that Christ lives in them and gives them new life um and empowers them for a life of godliness um but also um how now we train those people to witness and how they how they share the gospel how um how they become witnesses for jesus you know that like well we looked at on sunday in acts one talked about being a witness you will be my witnesses witness from the greek word martyr right you're you're witnessing with your life um that's the whole that's the whole point of it um and that's our ultimately that's our purpose uh individually um and it's our purpose as a church um as a local church that uh, is also what drives us so i'm just excited to see um, where God is taking us. And again, one of the things that excites me the most is uh, seeing the church excited. And um, I have been sensing that the, um, everybody's you know really excited for what God has been doing and what God is going to do. Um, so it's going to be a fun ride. So as we are revisioning or revisiting the mission of Bayside, can you restate for us what the mission statement is that we have in our bylaws? Yes, yeah, so our mission statement uh, simply says this. Our mission is to bring glory to God by leading people into fruitful relationships with Jesus Christ. So you have, um, you know, ultimately the reason we exist is for God's glory, period. Um, and then he tells us, you know, how how we could bring glory to him, um, you know, how we live our lives, how we structure um, our lives, what, what we're passionate about, the things that will bring him the most glory. And that is by leading people into fruitful relationships with Jesus Christ. And we say fruitful um, because we don't just say uh, leading people into relationships with Jesus Christ, um, because that doesn't really capture the full essence of discipleship. That would be more of conversion. Right, we don't just bring them to baptism and say, "Hey, you're done now." <laughs> exactly, exactly. We want to we want to disciple them to the point where they will bear fruit, right? Where they will um, grow in the knowledge of uh, Scripture, where they will then develop others who um, will get saved and discipled and go through that whole process. So that's what we mean by fruitful relationships with Jesus Christ, and it's that fruit part too, um, that advancing the kingdom, that uh, overflowing with with generosity. Um, that uh, what date Pastor Dave is going to uh, hit on next week. Um, so I'll give an early plug for next week's sermon. So there you go. Awesome. Now, we might look at the whole Bible as segments of stories that are broken up into different books, and that would be a big mistake. Specifically, the book of Acts is a letter written as a ministry report uh, from Luke to Theopolis. Theophilus. 
not Theopolis, that's a city. No, um, Theophilus. Uh, so we touched on who Theophilus was in our Advent series when we discussed Luke's Gospel, uh, whether or not this is a real person or a pseudo name for a group of believers. But the point is, Luke was commissioned to write both ministerial reports for Theophilus. Now, you mentioned on Sunday that Luke's trained vocation was as a physician, something that Paul would need often. <laughs> Uh, unlike most of the original 12 disciples, Luke was well-educated and was both eloquent and succinct in his language. The book of Acts is unique in the New Testament as it introduces us to several people that are only mentioned here. And I can't help but reason that it is the details in this book that gives it its credence. Excellent background, by the way, on Thank Luke. I, I can't add to that. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> so let's talk about um, some of those things that are in the, the discussion guide. So let's talk about the biblical meaning of baptized by the Holy Spirit. Mm. And how many times does the, the book of Acts touch on that? Um, yeah, that's a, uh, that's a good question. So, yeah, you see in there where... Jesus uh, tells the disciples, you know, they're, they're there's a wait in Jerusalem um, for the promise of the Father. Um, and so they're uh, in, in Jerusalem waiting, and, you know, we have to, well, what's the promise of the Father? And you go back and he says, well, you know, John baptized with water, but uh, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Um, so, you know, there's a lot, there's historically, there's been a lot of confusion about the whole, um, you know, baptism of the Holy Spirit. but uh, I, without getting too deep in, in, into the woods with this, bapti, baptize comes from baptizo. It means to fully immerse. And obviously the, what you see in the Old Testament, um, I think the uh, kind of a good way of describing it or explaining it is um, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was like a trickle. Um, he would, you know, as, as God saw fit in his sovereignty and his providence, he would send his spirit uh, upon certain um people for certain seasons to accomplish his purposes. Um, but then what you see in the New Testament um, with uh, the church, the birth of the church in Jerusalem um, in the book of Acts, that baptizing with the spirit is now it's no longer a trickle, um, but now it's a full flood. It's a deluge. It's a complete immersion um, for every single follower of Christ. Um, so the, 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 the important thing there is um, understanding that. So this is, you know, this was descriptive for the uh, original disciples. You, you can't necessarily look at all of Acts uh, prescriptively. It's descriptive. So you can't look at every single thing and say, oh, this is exactly what we have to do. Um, remember, it's, it's a church history book. It's a, you know, like you said, that church manual. Um, so this is a descriptive thing that happened um, when the Holy Spirit uh, fell upon the uh, disciples and the followers in the upper room. And you see that in Acts 2. Um, so being baptized with means now the, the Holy Spirit has fully come upon them. They have they have full access um, to all of God's resources. And that's why Jesus said, hey, it's better for me to go up. It's better for me to depart because I'm going to send you someone and you guys are going to do greater things than I've done. And they're like, well, how can we do that? We're not the son of God. Well, it's because Jesus was sending his own spirit um, into every single one of his disciples. <laughs> so that's I mean, that's mind blowing, really, when you think about it, like, wow, we have the same spirit. Um, and Jesus wants to do uh, mighty things in and through us. Um, so uh, being baptized with the Spirit um, happened at uh, the day of Pentecost with the church, and it happens now for believers um, at the moment of conversion. They are baptized. Um, they are completely immersed um, in the Spirit, um, and the Spirit comes in and dwells them, and they're baptized um, because now that the Spirit indwells them, they're also given... Um, the broad adoption into God's family and uh, access into his kingdom. So they're citizens as well. Um, so in a nutshell, that's essentially uh, what you see is it's the, the, bap the baptism, being baptized with the spirit is um, being fully immersed um, with all of the salvific resources of Jesus, um, particularly his Holy Spirit. And then this also happened for the, people who were in Cornelius's house, that's Acts chapter 9, 
Uh, what we see in Acts chapter 2, that was for the, the Jews, and then Cornelius was, was not a Jew. He was uh, a Roman centurion, and so these were the Gentiles now being included, and that's, uh, that's the example for us, is, is those were including the Old, Pe Old Testament people into this, and now we are in the New Testament people from the Gentiles, fulfilling that promise to Abraham that it was going to, the promise was going to extend past just his birth lineage people, and it be extended to the entire world. Now, when we talk about the spread of the gospel and the realized growth of the church, one of the differences of how the church grows and how Judaism grew is that the main way to make more Jews was to have more Jewish babies. Hmm. So there was a complete change in the ability to ex access the gospel and have access to God, uh, thus allowing for all people groups to come in. And I don't want us to be stuck in the idea that our main purpose in life as Christians is to just have more Christian babies. That, that's the Old, uh, Old <laughs> Testament way of thinking about this. We, that's the be fruitful and multiply, you know, when the earth actually needed to be multiplied. <laughs> right. But our mission, as stated in Acts chapter 1, is to go and make disciples, not birth more disciples, <laughs> but to make more. You know, Marcus, that, that's a really good point. Um, Vance Havner, um, following up with what you just said, just a real quick quote, Vance Havner um, who I actually quoted in the sermon as well, taught when he was talking about how the church, how the church has lost its spiritual power because of self reliance and not spiritual reliance, spirit dependence. Uh, but Fans Havner said this: He said, "The gospel is not something we come to church to hear; it's something we go from church to tell." <laughs> you know, so of course we do come to church to hear the gospel, um, but that that's that's not where. It, it ends. That's actually where it starts. You know, you, you start your day, start your week with Sunday. You come and hear the gospel. You worship with the saints. There's the edification, the, the worship, the fellowship. Uh, and, oh, man, it's such a beautiful thing. And then, so you came and he heard the gospel. Now you go out the rest of the six days and you go tell the gospel. Um, but that's where there is a, a breakdown. And um, and I get it. You know, it's it's hard. You know, it's we're living in times where... Um, everybody's redefining everything and even redefining history, you know, missions has, is getting like, it has a bad rap, um, you know, for colonialism and all the, this nonsense. And it, it's, it's bogus. Um, this is our, this is our commission. Um, and if the world wants to uh, uh, call it oppressive, um, call it whatever they, they will, it's, they're not understanding Christ number one. Um, and that what the world says doesn't, uh, ultimately affect what we do and what God has called us to do. So, yeah, go out and <laughs> share the gospel. Now, you had three main points in the sermon. The strength for our mission is unlimited. Yep. The substance of our message is undeniable. Mm -hmm. And the scope of our ministry is unbounded. You want to talk about those for a minute? Uh, yeah, I am so glad I was able to get uh, three S words, three M words, and three U words. <laughs> Man, I love my I love my alliteration. It's so helpful for myself. I hope it's helpful for some of you. But <laughs> yeah, it's it's it's, uh, it's how we write. <laughs> but yeah, so those are the three points. And you know, I kind of I kind of hit them real quick when we finished verse eight. Um, you know, the strength for our mission is unlimited. Who is the one who strengthens us for our mission? That's none other than the indwelling Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit is not limited in power. Therefore. Um, whatever strength we need to be his witnesses, he's going to give us. It's really that, that, that simple. Um, so yeah, so that's what we were talking about. The, you know, the church's need to depend on the spirit, um, you know, not to ignore the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And I think what, what has happened too, um, and, and you can see kind of a pendulum there's in history, there's always this pendulum swing, right? If when, uh, when, so, so you had the Azusa street revivals, um, you know, kind of the, the, it kind of really birthed the charismatic and Pentecostal church in the Western, in the Western church. And uh, so, you, so in response to the, um, I, I'm going to say overemphasis of the Holy Spirit, I'm not sure you could overemphasize God, but, um, but in response to maybe even a, a distortion of mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit, I guess I'll say is, was a complete um, pendulum swing to the other extreme 
where it was as if the Holy Spirit within a few decades became, you know, the forgotten member of the Trinity. Um, everything was God, the father, God, the son. And uh, I think we're, you know, at a place now in, in the Western church um, where we are finding the middle ground um, between what the whole, who the Holy Spirit is and what his work uh, is in and through us. Um, so, yeah, so it's, uh, it, it's really it, it's so important to recognize that we do not witness in our own strength. Um, you know, that, that fear that you feel um, when you kind of feel led to maybe share something with somebody and you're hesitant, um, that's, that's normal. Um, and the moment you, 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 in that moment, you just pray, Lord, Jesus, help me. And open your mouth and start speaking. <laughs> well, you ask questions, 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 questions. Questions are the greatest things too. You share a little bit of your story, be a witness to how Jesus uh, saved and redeemed you. Um, and I mean, I'll, I'll give a, an example of this, a personal example. I didn't really get to share any on Sunday. A few years back uh, at a barber shop in Manahawken, um, it's closed now, but um, I was there not too long before Christmas one year, getting a haircut. Uh, girl Brianna was cutting my hair, talking a little bit. Um, you know, kind of a, a rough little barber shop. <laughs> not a place I'd take my kids. Lots of cursing and stuff. But uh, so we're talking a little bit, and she asked me what I did, and you know, I told her I was a pastor, and then um, you know, that didn't uh, scare her, so that was good. But all these things, we were just chit chatting, and then you know, we were there for an hour, hour and a half, just talking. And she was cutting my hair, and then I came back again. You know, I there were some seeds planted. She knew me. Um, she got to know me. I got to know her a little bit. Came back again a month later. Um, and then we were talking. It was after Christmas and she was sharing a little bit about how she wasn't doing too well. It was a hard Christmas. She was having some depression. And in that moment, I thought, uh, all right, this is the beginning of the haircut. <laughs> I have about an hour, an hour and a half left. Um, so do I uh, now talk about my story? And I almost wasn't going to. Um, and <laughs> I was like, yeah. Shut up, <laughs> just speak. And I did. And it was all Jesus, you know, so just shared my story, my history with depression. Um, and she was moved to tears um, as I was just sharing that because she couldn't believe that a pastor, you know, whoever, whatever presupposition she had of what a pastor might be. Um, she couldn't believe that that was a struggle of mine. Uh, and then, of course, telling her the difference Jesus made. Uh, and it was such an awesome thing seeing her come to, uh, you know, so she did, she start, started coming to church. She got saved and everything. Uh, she's now, I don't know, she does something in the military, some top secret thing in the military. But, um, yeah, it was just, but that's, that's just an example. And I'm not, you know, holding myself up as, as, as the, <laughs> the role model, but, um, it's just be bold and depend on the spirit and, and let, let him. And guess what? If it, if it fails miserably and you're depending on the spirit, it's his problem. <laughs> you're depending on the spirit. That is what you're supposed to do. So don't worry about the results. Don't worry about anything else. Just trust Jesus. Right. And because he is the substance of our message. Yeah, that's right. Good segue. <laughs> he is the substance of our message. Um, you know, so it's an undeniable message. You know, you, you, when you're sharing the gospel, then, you know, people might ask. Uh, again, when you're sharing your story, excellent. But then when people start asking questions about, do you really believe Jesus lived? Do you really believe uh, he was raised from the dead? Do you really believe that he actually died? Um, you know, you the all of the the, the evidence surrounding Jesus, uh, his 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 birth, his his life, his ministry, his uh, casting out of demons, his per performing of miracles. Um, his, um, his, re his uh, death, his burial, his resurrection, these are all historically documented events. You don't have to look, if you're a believer, you have to look at scripture as the word of God. But if you're an unbeliever, you could look at, you could simply explain to an unbeliever as a believer, hey, this is, don't, un don't look at this as the holy word of God. Look at these, look at these books, look at these four gospels as reliable um, ancient documents, because that's what they are, because there's a lot of, uh, th there's so much evidence uh, and textual criticism has showed that, yeah, everything these four Gospels say, um, it re really did happen. Um, at least the people who wrote them really believed that they happened, and they really believed that they saw all these things. And even uh, atheist um, textual critics will come to that conclusion. Um, so <laughs> it's true, guys. We're, we're not 
we're not forcing, uh, you know, a, a message of, you know, be healed by essential oils or be saved by this, you know, abstract, uh, uh, ethereal thing. But you, you, we're we're sharing the gospel, and it's a, a gospel is historically rooted, um, uh, a message that has undeniable evidence. And then our points from Acts chapter one give us the scope of our ministry. And that's to be going to the ends of the earth. Yeah, that's right. Start right, Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. You know, those kind of like that ripple effect. You throw throw a rock in the lake, and it ripples. And that's that's a that's just a, a cool picture for um, how the light of Christ and the kingdom of God in one locale is supposed to um, spread and affect. Uh, everything uh, around it uh, increasingly going out um, geographically further. Um, and that is what happens when um, Christians are uh, living as missionaries um, wherever they are. Now, let's take a minute and talk about the Bless Every Home initiative. Mm. We spent some time talking about that. On Sunday, there were some QR codes that were up on the screen. And, and we've seen some results from the, the people in our congregation uh, accepting that challenge. What have, what have we got for an update? Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I'll pull that up here in a sec. But yeah, so this Bless Every Home, um, what is this uh, initiative? Um, you all, If you're listening and you haven't signed up yet, all you do is go to blesseveryhome.com forward slash Bayside Chapel blesseveryhome.com forward slash Bayside Chapel, or you click on the Be A Light link uh, in our app. So basically what this is, is a really cool uh, program. It uses, you know, uh, some census data and everything. And you input your address, and it will show you your closest neighbors. Um, it will then email you daily with, like, five uh, neighbors. Um, it will send you their name, um, and you pray for them. That's it. You're praying for your neighbor. You're praying for their salvation. You're praying for opportunities to get to know them. You're praying that uh, the, the Lord would strengthen you, that you'd be sensitive to the Spirit's uh, leading and direction. You're praying f that revival would come to your neighborhood. Um, so that's the first step. You, you pray. That's all you're doing. You're committing to pray. Um, and then as you pray, you're going to be shocked to see the way the Lord is going to use that. Um, you're going to then get opportunities to care for your neighbors to be the hands and feet of Jesus, right? So you have the praying, the caring. Then, ultimately, the goal is to, to get to sharing the gospel. Um, so you pray, care, share. That's kind of the, the format that Bless Every Home follows. Um, and you're able to uh, to let us know, to designate, you know, if, if you've prayed for a neighbor, awesome. You you just, in your email, you just like check a little, check a little button and we get to see then uh, how many homes have been adopted Um from our members. And at this point, we have uh, 70 people committed to praying. Um, and that represents uh, over 2,000 adopted homes. Um, so we're going to, uh, I'd like I'd like to see uh, us having over 100 people uh, at Bayside praying for our neighbors. So we're going to we're, we're going to see how the way the Lord uses all this, but absolutely. If you have not signed up for this, please do that. It's just, it, it's just a beautiful way to really be intentional with being on mission. And guess what? When you start praying for your neighbors, um, you're not going to want to avoid them as much as you may want to now. <laughs> right. This uh, is the time of year. It's kind of easy to avoid right. your neighbors. Everybody's got their doors shut. Yeah, doors that's right. Shut, keep the cold out. So this is the time that you can pray and care for them. And then, when it's nice and you, you're walking the neighborhood again in a couple of weeks, have the opportunity to share. Yeah, that's it. There you go. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, in a few weeks we'll we'll be able to get back outside again, and uh, and that's that's when you share. Um, and then as you get to know your neighbors, you could t you could just ask, "Hey, how can I be praying for you?" Um, you could actually ask them specifically and see what kind of conversations those leads to. Trust Jesus. Trust. Jesus, stop. Don't rely on yourself. Don't worry. Don't worry about the fears and the anxieties. Trust, 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 trust Jesus. Um, and uh, one of the things uh, I, I was going to share, because I know oftentimes a response or reaction to a pastor telling you to go out and share the gospel is, well, I'm not just wired that way. Um, or I don't know what to say. 
or I'm not smart enough. Um, or I don't know my Bible well enough. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good. Right. I'm, I don't know my Bible well enough. You know, it's easy for you, Ken. You're a pastor. Well, trust me, I still don't know my Bible. <laughs> um, that's why it'll be a lifetime of studying the scriptures. So don't wait for any of those things. All you have to do is just tell Jesus the difference he made in your life and start there and see where the Lord leads. Um, and you could actually look through the New Testament, um, you know, because uh, there's different different ways people have actually shared the gospel. You know, it's you don't have to, um, you know, start hitting them with with Bible tracks every time you see them. Um, you can if you want, if they're receptive to that. Absolutely. Um, but I'm saying that's not if, if that's not how you're wired then don't do that. Um, so uh, some years ago, Mark Middleberg, who was director of evangelism at uh, Willow Creek uh, Church in Chicago, um, he kind of custom design or he, he looked at scripture and saw how God custom designed um, different combinations of personalities and temperament um, and how he used that in scripture uh, to to use those people to reach others in a way uh, that fit their design. Um, so uh, in in one of his books, he says, um, uh, consider these six people in the New Testament. So you have Peter, right? You have Peter, Paul, the blind man, the Samaritan, Matthew, and Dorcas. So there's six people in the New Testament. How did Peter share the gospel? Well, Peter's was very confrontational. Peter had a confrontational approach. He was direct. He was bold. He was to the point. How did Paul share the gospel? Paul wasn't as confrontational. Paul's was more of an intellectual approach. He could be confrontational, but he was well-educated. He could reason from scriptures. He could explain and prove that Jesus was the Christ. All right, so Peter's confrontational. Paul's intellectual. Then you have the blind man. The blind man, his was simply a testimonial approach, right, in John 9. The man in John 9 didn't know a great deal of theology, but he could say, one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. That's sharing the gospel. Um, so testimonial approach. Then you have the Samaritan woman. What was her approach? Hers was an invitational approach, right? She left her water jug at the well. And then you see in John 4, the woman went to her village and invited her friends to come and hear the man who told me everything I ever did. And then you have Matthew's interpersonal approach. In Luke 5, 29, Matthew put on a, a big banquet for his tax collecting buddies, uh, trying to expose them to Jesus. Right, So he relied on the relationships that he'd built with these men, and he wanted to sh further shore up their friendships um, and use those as channels for evangelism. So Matthews was interpersonal. And then you have Dorcas. Right? Dorcas's approach was a very service-oriented. Um, in Acts 9 is when you, where you meet uh, Dorcas, um, who uh, witnessed by serving others in Jesus' name. She made clothes for the needy, and she helped the poor. Um, so you could see there are so many different ways um, that you can be on mission, that you could reach others for Christ. Um, and that's uh, that's what I, I'm hoping is for any of you that are listening that are involved in, um, especially one of our sermon series life groups, um, talk about these things, encourage each other, hold each other accountable um, uh, in, in, sharing, in sharing the gospel and, and bring to the table, bring to your weekly meetings, um, different people that you're praying for, different um, opportunities, uh, interactions that you've had with them. See what the Lord does with that. And so as we end our time this week, um, we'd like to encourage our listeners to think back on their salvation story. Who were the people mm. that were there? And who did God use to toil the, the, this, the earth in your heart, the, those hardness? Uh, you know, when, when they till the soil, they're trying to get the rocks out so that there's good fertile ground to plant seeds. Who were those people that planted seeds in your life? for those seeds of repentance, to recognize your sin, and to come to an understanding of who Jesus was. And then ask yourself, have you made yourself a usable resource for God to reach your community, your neighborhood, and those in your family that don't know Jesus? Have you seen the story of Jesus change someone's life forever? And so we're just going to leave those questions out there for you to think about and, and talk about with, uh, with other people that you're, you're in relations with. Because the work of the Lord is advancing his church to the ends of the earth. And you are a part of this plan. Now, next week, overflowing. Yeah, next week, overflowing. So we talked uh, two weeks ago, becoming, becoming like Jesus. Um, you know that the, the emphasis there is the transformation of the saints. Um, last week was advancing the gospel. 
Next week is, uh, we're calling, we're overflowing with generosity, right? Our, our third vision priority. And this is really the expansion of the kingdom. Um, you know, people responding to the gospel, being developed as leaders, and then going out and, and multiplying. So it's essentially multiplication, leadership multiplication that, that we're talking about there. So, um, yeah, so we're going to look a little, Pastor Dave's going to uh, walk us through a little bit uh, of Tim, about Timothy's life, um, how... Uh, he was discipled, what the influences were in his life, and then uh, how uh, how God used him then to further uh, expand the kingdom through uh, other disciples. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what the Lord is going to speak to us uh, and through Dave on Sunday. Excellent. And after we finish next Sunday, we begin our sermon series that prepares us for Easter. And we'll be in the book of Isaiah. Yeah, we're going to be looking at um, four servant songs of Isaiah. Uh, the final one we're going to divide into two, uh, two weeks. So it's going to be a five-week sermon series. Um, it, throughout the throughout the Old Testament book of Isaiah, Isaiah the Old Testament prophet, um, he talks about his servant Israel. Uh, there's a lot of these prophecies about Israel being called servant, but then there are four particular places where it's very um, it's very clear that. Uh, the servant is someone different, someone unique, someone special because of uh, the kinds of things that are associated with this servant. And in some some of our Bibles, um, it's that you'll see actually where it says servant there um, when it's referring to this uh, mysterious servant-like figure. It's capitalized. Um, and the, so that servant is not other than Jesus Christ. Um, so we're going to look at um, how what those four servant songs tell us about the uh, identity of Jesus, uh, about his person, about his his character, uh, and about his work. Um, so yes, it's going to be a it's going to be a cool five week series, kind of looking at uh, Jesus through 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 an Old Testament lens. Um, so uh, stay tuned for that. Great. All right. Well, thank you again, Pat Shaken, for joining us this week. We look forward to next week. Thank you, everybody, for spending your time with us. Have a blessed week. Yeah, have a blessed week. And thank you, Marcus, for doing this for us week in and week out. Thank you, Pastor Ken. It certainly is a pleasure.